The Battle of Karbala took place on the 10th of Muharram in the year 61 of the Islamic calendar, or October 10th, 680 AD. On one side of the highly uneven battle were a small group of supporters and relatives of Muhammad's grandson, Hussein ibn Ali. And on the other side was a large military detachment from the forces of Yazid, the Mayyid Caliph. The rule of the third Caliph, Uthman ibn Affan, concluded with a violent uprising. This uprising ended with his assassination, and for many days, rebels seized and occupied the city of Medina. Under the overwhelming pressure of the Ummah, Ali ibn Abi Talib was elected as the fourth Caliph with massive numbers of people swearing their allegiance to him. His immediate steps were to ensure the unity of Muslims. The governor of Sham, or Damascus, was Mabia ibn Abu Sufyan, who was a devoted supporter of the murdered Caliph Uthman and refused allegiance to Ali and revolted against him using his cousin's unjust murder as an excuse. This resulted in armed confrontations between the Islamic Caliph Ali ibn Abu Talib and Mavia. The Muslim world became divided at the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. His eldest son, Hassan ibn Ali, succeeded him. However, he soon signed a treaty with Mavia to avoid further bloodshed. Mavia remained the ruler of Sham. Prior to his death, Mavia was actively plotting a major deviation from Islamic norms. He was establishing his son, Yazid, as the next ruler, hence establishing dynastic rule for the first time in Islam. This was a move which was considered unacceptable by the leaders of the Ummah, including the second son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hussein ibn Ali. He knew that the appointment of Yazid as the heir of the Caliphate would lead to hereditary kingship, which was against the original political teachings of Islam. Therefore, he resolved to confront Yazid. Yazid instructed his governor of Medina, Walid ibn Udba, to force Hussein ibn Ali to pledge allegiance to Yazid. He refused this and declared his famous saying, Anyone akin to me will never accept anyone akin to Yazid as Caliph. Imam Hussein departed Medina on the 28th of Rajab, 60 AH, two days after Walid's attempt to force them to submit to Yazid's rule. It is mainly during his stay in Mecca that he received many letters from Kufa assuring him their support and asking him to come over there and guide them. He answered their calls and sent Muslim Ibn Aqil, his cousin, to Kufa as his advocate in an attempt to consider the exact situation and public opinion of Kufa. Muslim Ibn Aqil was welcomed by the people of Kufa and most of them swore allegiance to him. After this initial observation, Muslim Ibn Aqil wrote to Hussein Ibn Ali. He wrote that the situation in Kufa was favourable. However, after the arrival of the new governor of Kufa, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the scenario changed. Muslim ibn Aqil and his host Hani bin Urwa were executed on the 9th of Sulhaj, or September 10th, 680 AD. Without any considerable resistance of the people, they shifted the loyalties of the people of Kufa in favour of Yazid against Hussein ibn Ali. Imam Hussein also realised a deep conspiracy was going on. Yazid had appointed Umar Asad as the head of an army, ordering him to take charge of the pilgrimage caravans and to kill Hussein ibn Ali wherever he could find him, even during Hajj. Hence the Imam decided to leave Mecca on Aysul Hajj 68 H, just a day before Hajj, and converted his Hajj into an Umrah because of his concern about potential violation of the sanctity of the Kaaba. He delivered a famous sermon in Mecca, highlighting his reasons to leave, that he didn't want the sanctity of the Kaaba to be violated, since his opponents had crossed any norm of decency and were willing to violate all tenets of Islam. He gave a speech to the people a day before his departure and said that death is a certainty for mankind. He stated, everyone who is going to devote his blood for our sake and is prepared to meet Allah must depart with us. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad appointed Umar ibn Saad to command the battle against Hussein ibn Ali. At first, Umar ibn Saad rejected the leadership of the army but accepted after Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad threatened to take away the governorship of the city of Bray and give it to someone else. Umar ibn Saad moved towards the battlefield with a strong army of 80,000 and arrived at Kerbala on the 2nd of Muharram. Ibn Ziyad sent a brief letter to Umar ibn Saad that commanded him to prevent Hussein and his followers from accessing water and do not allow them to drink a drop of it. 
Ibn Sa'd followed the orders and 5,000 horsemen blocked the river. One of the Imam's followers met Umar Ibn Sa'd and tried to negotiate some sort of access to water, but it was harshly denied. Umar Sa'd received an order from Ibn Zayd to start the battle immediately and not to postpone it further. The army started advancing towards Hussein's camp on the 9th of Muharram. At this point, Imam Hussein sent his brother Abbas ibn Ali to ask to wait until the next morning so that he and his men could spend the night praying. Ibn Sa'd agreed to start the battle the next morning. On the night before the battle, Imam gathered his men and told them that they were all free to leave the camp in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness. If they stayed with him, they were sure to face certain death. None of Hussein's men defected and they all remained with him. Imam Hussein and his followers prayed and prostrated in front of their Lord all night. The next day, the battle began. Hussein ibn Ali completed the morning prayers with his companions. He appointed Zuhair ibn Qayn to command the right flank of his army and Habib ibn Muzahir to command the left flank of the army and his brother Abbas ibn Ali as the standard bearer. Hussein ibn Ali's companions numbered 32 horsemen and 40 infantrymen. Hussein rode on his horse Zuljana. Hussein ibn Ali called the people around him to join him for the sake of Allah and to defend Prophet Muhammad's family. His speech affected Hur bin Yazid Rahai, who had stopped Imam Hussein on his journey to Kufa. He abandoned Umar bin Sa'd's army and joined Imam Hussein's small band of followers. Ibn Ziyad had sent Shumar along with a few thousand soldiers to join Umar bin Sa'd's army and help him command the battalion. The battle started when Ibn Sa'd advanced and fired an arrow at Hussein bin Ali's camp. Ibn Sa'd's archers started showering Hussein's army with arrows. Hardly any men from Hussein bin Ali's army escaped from being shot by an arrow. Both sides began fighting. The first skirmish was between the right flank of Imam Hussein's army with the left flank of Yazid's forces. The followers under the command of Zuhair bin Qayyim fought heroically and repulsed the initial infantry attack and in the process destroyed the left flank of the enemy. Seeing this, the enemy quickly retreated. Umar ordered his army not to come out for any duel and to attack Hussein bin Ali's army together. Shimmer attacked Imam Hussein's right wing, but the men were able to maintain their stride, kneeling down as they planted their lances. Thus, they were able to frighten the enemy's horses when the horsemen came back to charge at them again. Imam Hussein's men met them with their arrows, killing some of them and wounding others. Shimmer and Ibn Sa'd kept saying the following to their men. Fight those who abandoned their religion and who deserted the Ummah. Hearing them say these awful accusations, Imam Hussein said to them, Are you really instigating people to fight me? Are we really the ones who abandoned their religion while you yourself say you upheld it? Soon, as our souls part from our bodies, you will find out who is more worthy of entering the fire and who will enter the peaceful gardens of heaven. In order to prevent random and indiscriminate showering of arrows on Imam Hussein's camp, which had women and children in it, Imam Hussein's followers went out to fight single combat. Men like Burair bin Qasay, Muslim bin Osija, and Abib bin Muzahir were slain in the fighting. They were attempting to save Imam Hussein's life by shielding him. Every casualty had a considerable effect on their military strength, since they were vastly outnumbered by Yazid's army. Imam Hussein's companions were coming one by one to say goodbye to him. Imam Hussein's companions were killed by the never-ending arrows, single combats, and the large enemy that surrounded them and was thirsty for their blood. After Imam Hussein's companions were killed, his relatives asked his permission to fight. The men of Badu Hashim, the clan of Muhammad and Ali, went out one by one to fight the oppressive enemy. Casualties from Manu Hashim were sons of Abu Talib, sons of Hassan and Hussein bin Ali, and sons of Abdullah bin Jafar bin Abu Talib and Bibi Zainab, and the rest of the courageous and noble tribe. There were 72 Hashimis dead in all, including Imam Hussein. The Martyrdom of Abbas bin Ali Abbas advanced towards the river Euphrates, killing the enemy charging towards him. He continued his advance into the heart of Ibn Sa'd's army. He was under a heavy shower of arrows, but was able to penetrate them and get to the river. He immediately started filling the water skin in a remarkable and immortal gesture of loyalty to his brother and Muhammad's grandson. He did not drink any water despite being severely thirsty. 
He put the water skin on his right shoulder and started riding back to where they tents. Imad ibn Sa'ad ordered his army to kill him, saying that if Abbas succeeds in taking water back to his camp, we will not be able to defeat them. A massive army blocked his way and surrounded him. He was ambushed from behind. A soldier cut off his right arm. He put the water skin on his left shoulder and continued his way. However, his left arm was also cut off. Abbas now held the water skin with his teeth. The army of Ibn Sa'd started shooting arrows at him. One arrow hit the water skin and water poured out of it. Now he turned his horse back towards the army and charged towards them. But one arrow hit his eye and someone hit the back of his head with a huge lance and he fell off the horse. In his last moments, Abbas was trying to wipe the blood in his eyes to enable him to see Imam Hussein's face. He asked his brother not to take his body back to the camps because he had promised to bring back water, but failed. He could not bear to face his beloved niece Sakina, the daughter of Imam Hussein. Then, upon the insistence of the Imam, Abbas called him brother for the first time in his life, instead of calling him master or sir. Before the death of Abbas ibn Ali, the Imam said, Abbas, your death is like the breaking of my back. The martyrdom of Imam Hussein. Imam rides towards the enemy. There is a shower of arrows. Imam ignores the arrows and rides on. He wants to make one last effort to preach true Islam to the enemies of Islam. He stops and turns towards the enemy and begins to speak. O oh, those of you who do not know me, know that I am the grandson of the Holy Prophet. I am on the path of truth. Yazid personifies falsehood and corruption. He wants to lead you away from Islam. Do not follow him. Do not kill the grandson of Allah's messenger. Allah will never forgive you. Remember that when you see a ruler who does what has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, who indulges in sins, who oppresses the people he rules, and you do nothing to stop such a ruler. Before Allah, you are as guilty as he is. You know my ancestry. My parents did not raise me to submit myself to an evil tyrant. I am your Imam. You have surrendered the freedom of your mind to the evil ways of Yazid. If you do not care for Islam, do at least care for the freedom of your spirit. Umar Saad cries out, do not fall victims to Hussein's sorcery. Kill him! From all directions, the soldiers advance towards Imam Hussein with their naked swords. Imam Hussein takes out his sword and begins to fight. Thirsty, tired, wounded, grieving, our Imam fights as no one had ever seen anyone fight. Wherever he turns to, the soldiers flee as rabbits do at the sight of a lion. Umar Saad sends all his best warriors against the Imam. They all perish. No one dares come near our Imam. Imam stands on his stirrups. Hussein looks at the sky. Yes, it is the time of Asr. Hussein returns the sword into the sheath. Seeing that Imam has sheathed the sword, the enemy comes from all sides. Some throw stones at him, some hit him with swords. Arrows are shot at him. Suddenly, the horse stops. Imam Hussein falls from the horse, but his body does not touch the ground. It is resting on the blades of the arrows. He performs his utter prayers, lying on this mat of arrows. Now he goes into his last sajda and says, O oh Allah, all praises to you and you alone. Someone is moving towards where our Imam is in sajda on the arrows. He is holding a dagger in his hand. It is shimmer. He comes towards our Imam and mounts on his chest. With twelve strikes of his dagger, shimmer cuts our Imam's head. Slowly and painfully. The earth had trembled. Euphrates had broken its banks. From the camp of the family of the Holy Prophet, such lamentation arose as had never been heard before. As the sun was setting in the horizon, the soldiers rushed to Imam Hussein's camp in search of booty. They looted every tent. Every lady and every girl was stripped of her whale. Fatima's daughters were left bareheaded. They set fire to all the tents. Such evil, such oppression, the likes of which never seen before. Imam Hussein's sacrifice, his fight against oppression and injustice, revealed to the Ummah the true face of the Umayyad Caliphate. 
and prevented the destruction and the elimination of Islam and taught us to never surrender to the oppressor and always stand with the oppressed.